Why is everyone listening to GlobalTalkRadio.com? Because it's the future of talk radio. Every day, more and more people are finding Internet Radio as not just an alternative media, but as a replacement to traditional AM and FM broadcast stations. Internet Radio offers a wider variety of programs, giving it on-demand listening that meets your schedule and fewer commercial interruptions. And GlobalTalkRadio.com is already leading the way by matching this content with a highly targeted Internet audience. GlobalTalkRadio.com offers its listeners one of the widest programming varieties on the Internet, from business and finance to self-improvement, paranormal, health, literature, romance, politics, and more. There are also opportunities for prospective hosts who would like to host their own weekly or one-time talk shows. Want to learn more? Check us out at www.globaltalkradio.com and see the future of talk radio today. You're listening to globaltalkradio.com. The following program is provided for informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed during the show do not necessarily reflect those of the station or the host. There are no guarantees to the information presented in this material, and the claims and results of any cannot be guaranteed. As always, you should consult with a professional before making any decisions that may impact your legal, financial, and medical well-being. And now, the best of Journeys with Rebecca. Welcome. Are you ready to take a journey? With me into knowledge, enlightenment, and discovery? Then let's journey again together. This is your host, Rebecca Jernigan, and you're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. Good evening, good evening, good evening, and what a show I have for you tonight. The very, very special guest. Her name is Phyllis Galdi, and she is the owner and editor of Fate Magazine. We're going to be talking extensively with Phyllis later on in the show, and certainly a little bit later in this segment, I will be giving you some background information on this most wonderful person and her own personal journey, shall we say, uh, in Fate Magazine and what brought her to it. Um, this is going to be a great show tonight. You guys are not going to want to miss a thing. But first, as I do each and every week, would like to direct your attention to the website, World Wide Web Journeys with Rebecca.com. Now, you know the website changes each and every week. We do that to bring the latest information to all of you folks out there listening. And by the way, I'd like to take this opportunity at this time to say to each and every one of my listeners out there who have been listening, thank you so much for your dedication and your support. I so appreciate it. And if you're a new-time listener, welcome to the show. There's so many people that we have on, and we have so much information that we share. It's certainly a pleasure and an honor to be here, as I state all the time. And if you know of a, a specific guest that you would like to recommend, please do so. You can find the links all on my front page on how to suggest a guest, or if you have a particular topic that maybe you would like for me to discuss, I'd either be happy to try to bring a guest on or just do it myself. Also, we're going to be making some changes. There will be some shows coming up in the very near future that will be live call-in shows with some of my very specific um, the chosen guests, for the lack of a better way of saying it. And these guests have agreed to come on and answer questions live on air. So you're going to want to check back with the, on the website to get that information as to when those live shows will be on and when you can call in and get your questions answered or to even join in the discussion or topic of conversation. So, again, back to the website. We're going to direct your attention to Journeys News and Our World News. We always have some of the greatest links there to some of the newest and latest information, not only about earth changes but what's going on in the skies and the astrology department, also some very newsworthy events that go along with the genre of the show. So knowing all of that, and again, appreciating so much all of your dedication, I urge you to write to me, and you can write to me several different ways, Rebecca at journeyswithrebecca.com. Um, also, if you have an email question for the last segment of many of my shows, I do answer emails, and I do that by mailbag at journeyswithrebecca.com. If you have a guest, would be guest at journeyswithrebecca.com. Many, many ways to get a hold of us. Um, and also, we, we really do appreciate all those emails and letters and everything. We appreciate your support. But let's get back to tonight's guest. Her name, again, is Phyllis Galdi, the editor and editor, owner of Fate Magazine. Fate Magazine, for many of you, if you haven't l- looked at it recently, it's been around since 1948. Um, Phyllis and I will be discussing that and how she came to be um, editor and owner. And actually, this has happened several times for her. Um, you know, I always say spirit moves in mysterious ways, and it's it's um, a, truly a pleasure after listening to her life story about how she became editor and owner. It's in the most perfect and divine space that it can be in. Um, we are going to be talking extensively with Phyllis, not only about how she got involved with Fate Magazine, but also a little bit about 
where her background is and how it fits into it. Fate Magazine started out back in the 1948 when all the big UFO um, sensationalism, shall we say, uh, came to be. And in the 1940s and the 50s, for those of you who remember, such as myself, there was a lot of sensationalism about it. So it was about reporting UFOs and UFO activities. It was also about um, not so much as debunking it, but as trying to prove it. And there's been a lot of people that were contributing, um, writers and, and just contributors to Fate Magazine that you're going to hear about in tonight's interview that um, Phyllis is going to be talking about. Um, but Phyllis and I are going to get into to many different discussions on many different topic matters because it's all part of what the Fate Magazine is. It certainly has grown and evolved. She will be telling us about how to contact um, for your own a free copy of it. She will also be talking to you how to write to some of those that are um, guest editorials, or I'm sorry, editorials, and also um, weekly co or monthly columns um, so that you can get questions answered. Um, there's a, a wonderful pet psychic, so if you are wanting to ask questions about a pet psychic or your pet, she's the person that you can write to at Fate Magazine. We'll also be talking um, a little bit more about that later on in the show. Um, there's just so much more that we're going to be talking about. Life after death, haunted houses, spiritualism, ghost paintings. But stay tuned. You won't want to miss a thing. Check out Rebecca's website for the latest Journeys news and more. Log on to www.journeyswithrebecca.com. Welcome back, and you're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. We are here with a really fun guest tonight. Her name is Phyllis Galdi. She happens to be the editor and owner of Fate Magazine. And for those of you who recognize that name, yes, it has been around for a long time, since 1948. And the person we're speaking with today, as I, would, as I said earlier, is Phyllis Galdi. We welcome you to the show. Hello, Phyllis. Thank you very much. Oh, and it is absolutely a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. And we have got tons and tons and tons of things to cover. But first of all, um, one of the questions that I kind of wanted to ask you, because I know that there's a lot of people out there um, who they have an interest in, in, in how people get started. So what really started you um, in the whole process of working with or becoming the owner and the editor of Fate Magazine? Well, I guess I, first thing, I grew up in a haunted farmhouse in North Dakota, so when I was like three, four, five years old, I, I started experiencing, uh, the paranormal world and ghosts and heard things and saw things and, uh, you know, I grew up to be a school teacher and then I went on to work in a publishing field, so it was just a natural step for me to be involved with Fate Magazine. Well, let's talk a little bit about that haunted house for just a moment. Sure. <laughs> First of all, is I think might be a good way of, of, of starting the whole conversation is what to you determines what a haunted house is? Well, I think when there are paranormal happenings there, it wasn't just a normal house. Every night when I would go to bed in my little bedroom off the living room, there would be an image in the doorway. Every night I would see this uh, wispy, ghostly kind of uh, human form, and I was so scared. I was just terrified. I thought it was a ghost that was coming to hurt me or kill me or harm me. I was just terrified. So I would close my eyes and dash through the door and run through this image and go and jump in bed with my mother and my father because I just I couldn't stand to, to be in there because I saw this thing. And it was real to me. It was very real at five years old. No one could tell me I didn't see it. And they, my parents uh, just kind of tried to poo-poo it. But then when I got older, I found out that my grandfather had died in that very room. And, and my parents knew about this all along, and they were very open to the paranormal, but they were just trying to <clears throat> uh, uh, quiet my experiences, I guess, and, and uh, lessen it so I wouldn't be such a troublemaker in the house. So so I'd say, you know, paranormal is something beyond the, the normal, the ordinary. And I, I think most children up until the age of five can see spirits. Oh, and I'm going to agree with you 110%. And what typically happens is that when uh, my belief is, is when a child goes to school, um, they are around other children, and maybe these other children haven't been able to experience openness of conversation about their imaginary friends. That's mm -hmm. what we used to call them, mm -hmm. um, or our little guardian angels or spirit guides that are around us. And we're 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 kind of told that that's fantasy and that we shouldn't be doing that because we have to focus on our schoolwork. Sure, there's no monsters under the bed, but I'm here to tell <laughs> I don't, you I don't there agree are <laughs> there are elementals and things that come into the rooms. Oh, and I agree with that, and those elementals. And, you know, not everything is harmful, but I, I, think, no. I think one of the statements that we might we might want to make is that um, ghost hauntings or, or hauntings of houses or um, land or buildings of any kind is, is really something that is, is, is an everyday happening because the earth holds those energies. 
and there are stronger spirits than others that that make themselves known. And the question that I have for you is: You said you used to run through this um, apparition. I'll call it. Mm-hmm. Did you get a sense at all when you when you did that? I no, mean, I think I I just kind of scrunched up my body and 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 tensed up myself so I would have the courage. It's like going through a wall of flame or something to <laughs> me. It's, it's, uh, I just I just. Uh, um, tense my body and just ran real fast through it. Well, you know, but truly, that that's walking through your fear, and I think that was probably a, a very a very strong thing for you to have done at such a young age. You know, I grew up in a in a farmhouse, and we lived out in the middle of nowhere, and it was on uh, originally on Indian land, and mm-hmm. uh, behind the house was woods, and I used to go out there all the time. There was all these little I called them the little people, mm-hmm. and you know, I did that up until I was close to a teenager. Uh, I used to go out to the woods and, and visit with these wonderful little beings, and uh, they were all over, and it was. You know, those are the good memories that I have. Oh, sure. And they, they're just wonderful. But let's let's get back a little bit to Fake Magazine. It started out, um, you told me off the air, that it started in 1948 was its, was its first year of publication. What is the premise behind Fake Magazine? Um, the tagline is True Reports of the Strange and Unknown. It started out primarily as a UFO magazine when Kenneth Arnold had his famous sightings of the uh, spacecraft when he was flying a small airplane. <clears throat> and and that's really what the magazine started out with was paranormal experiences. And they also did a long series on the Richard Shaver experiences with uh, people living underground under the earth. And uh, then they started out with Atlantis kinds of stories. So it was all kinds of paranormal uh, manifestations and happenings. And some of the early stories were a little bit sensationalized, <clears throat> but there was a lot of uh, personal response from readers, and then they started evolving into sections called um, My Proof of Survival and True Mystic Experiences, and those have really been the essence and the heart of the magazine for the last 56 years, people's personal experiences with seeing uh, apparitions and loved ones who have gone on appear to them to tell them that they were okay in the spirit world and, and they would uh, guardian angels would appear and protect them or give them warnings about uh, possible accidents so that was really so they were truly the guardianships, and, and that's what they were, were were talking about is giving them um, ample um, forewarning is, is forearmed, as they say. That's right. <laughs> and it, and it would manifest over and over and over again for people. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the sensationalism. You know, I, I can remember, um, first of all, I can remember um, coming into uh, black and white movies, uh, just coming out of the uh, talkies, you know, the talkies mm-hmm. were on and, and talking movies and all of that, and those were, you know, reruns then. And um, there was a lot of a lot of sci-fi movies being made at that time that sensationalized the UFO thing. I think in some manner um, Hollywood might have been a little detrimental to the whole thing because our government obviously was trying to squish this information mm-hmm. so that people wouldn't wouldn't believe in it. They were saying, well, no, and they, you know, they said all of it was a hoax. But you know, uh, in some sense, Hollywood had had something to do with with keeping that alive and well in in that one sense. And then on the other hand. It kind of made it, you know, um, I don't know, very, very hokey in a sense. You know, the, the, the people from Mars and all of that. Um, there's a lot of truth in it in what they what they did. And sometimes I'm not sure that the Hollywood people don't really have some kind of channeling thing going on when they make some of these movies because there's a lot of truth in some of this fictional stuff that they're putting out. Um, but there was a lot of sensationalism back in the 40s and 50s and even into the mid 60s um, about UFOs and paranormal experiences. And it was really all about people trying to do, to debunk it. And so it's a wonderful thing to see this magazine that's been in existence since 1948. First of all, evolve, and second of all, become um, a product that people can still pick up every day, and they can interact with it, and they can learn all kinds of interesting things, and they can relate to it. And it certainly would answer some of their own maybe personal questions, and they must realize that they're not alone. You know, that the, these these instances, these experiences truly do happen to just everyday people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I find that really a, a very wonderful thing um, that, that the magazine has been able to go on. Um, you know, we talked a little bit um, the last time that we spoke. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the um, actual articles of the people that you have writing for you and, and how some of those uh, particular features of the magazine has kind of evolved and what it's, what it's actually um, evolved into. And I, I would love for you to share that with the audience so that they, they know that they have a place where they can write and what they can write about. Well, yes. Fate is really kind of a grassroots type of magazine. It is the reader's magazine. It's not written by professional fancy writers. Folks like you and me write in and tell their personal paranormal experiences, and that's what makes it so endearing because everybody has a story to tell. Everyone has had an experience. They've seen a 
a, a light in the sky. They've, they've seen a ghost in their in their house, and and uh, mm-hmm. a voice has told them to not go down this dark street. Uh, we've all had wonderful, wonderful paranormal experiences, and, and really, that's what makes the magazine special. And and we still invite readers to share their stories, and we actually pay for for articles. Well, now there's an idea. So for those of you who have your own personal experiences, please write. And we're going to give all that information, obviously, a little bit later in the show, where people can get a hold of it, of, of you and the magazine and, you know, where they can get all the subscription. And also, um, at this time, I want to let people know who are listening, because most everyone is listening on the web. They can go directly to your website, um, which is the World Wide Web, fate, F-A-T-E, mag, M-A-G, dot com. And they can go in there and take a look and browse while you and I, while they're sitting here listening um, to our, our conversation, they can actually go in. And your website is, is very well put together, by the way. It's Thank very you. easy to, to navigate. You. It's easy to find the information that you need. Um, it, it's, it's a very colorful site um, without being too busy where people can get lost in it. So it's a very nice nice website. Well, I really enjoy it. We're that. not rocket scientists, so we wanted to make it easy to use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something to be said about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, from your own personal experience, I know you said that you had um, uh, actually arrived at Fate Magazine, what did you say, about 15 years ago? Mm-hmm. And so what, you know, what drew you to, to the Fate Magazine? I mean, how did that all happen? That just sounds well, like I was, a... I was working for Llewellyn Publications as an editor, and they purchased Fate Magazine from Curtis and Mary Fuller, who were ready to retire at the time, and they just needed someone else to work on it. And because of my background and interest in uh, spiritualism and ghosts and life after death and Bigfoot and UFOs, I guess they thought that maybe I was a natural person to help out with the magazine. And then the other editor left, so I took over the editorship of it. And then <clears throat> interesting thing happened. One day I was driving down the street about four miles from my house, and I heard a voice say, hand in your resignation. And I looked around. I mean, the voice was as clear as I'm talking to you right now. And I said, what, what? I turned around. It said, spend this time with your dad. So I said, okay. And the next day I handed in my resignation. And I had three beautiful months with my father. And then he had a massive stroke. <clears throat> so it, it was uh, a voice speaking to me. And, and this voice has, has spoken to me several times throughout my career. And I listened to it and paid attention. Well, then, then, then I, I spent the time with my dad, and uh, a year and a half later, he did pass into the spirit world, and I had my own publishing book publishing company, and then a few years later, they called me back at Llewellyn to help w- with the magazine again, because they were considering selling it, and so we helped him out for a couple more years, and then, then I was able to be in a position to purchase it from Llewellyn, so, and here I am. Wow. That's a very fascinating story, though, and it's fascinating how the breaks in all of that happened for you. It was fated to be. (laughs) And therein lies the uh, whole magazine right there. (laughs) And uh, Kurt and Mary Fuller, the original owners, beautiful, beautiful people from uh, Chicago, they're still around once in a while. We do feel their their spiritual uh, presence and their involvement and their watching over the magazine. If they don't like something, boy, they let us know. (laughs) They were very... uh, very crotchety if something happens that they don't approve of. So kind of walk on eggshells. It's, it's like fate has its own guiding force with their help and with many, many spirits, uh, people who have loved it, who have passed on, who are still involved with it. Oh, that is absolutely wonderful that you have that, that guidance and that protection and, and the whole nine yards yes, on the other yes, side of the veil there. That's wonderful. Hey, stay tuned. There's more with Phyllis Goldie and Fate Magazine coming right up on Journeys with Rebecca. So don't go away. Are you at a crossroads in your life, or maybe you have a particular question, or need direction in romance, relationships, employment, whatever it might be, it's time to talk to Rebecca, a truly gifted intuitive and clairvoyant. Call and set up your private consultation. Get that special insight you've been looking for. Call 1-888-958-2768. That's 1-888-958-2768. Find out where your life's journey will lead you. Alternative Talk. Alternative Thoughts. You're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. Welcome back, and you're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. We are here with my guest, Phyllis Galdi, who is the editor and owner of Fate Magazine. We have had an exciting hour here so far, talking about life after death and haunted houses and spiritualism and Mark Twain and Helen Keller. It all flows in together, and it's just a very small world indeed when we get into that. 
But you know, last segment, um, Phyllis, we were talking about seances and how you um, were able to uh, get some instructions per, uh, professionally as well as attend some professionally and had some loved ones come with you. And I think one of the things that I would like to, you know, just to let people know is that, you know, seances and all that, everything needs to be conducted with intent, intent for goodness, uh, intent for direction. Um, is I My personal belief is, is that if you call someone forward specifically, Sometimes it's not always a good idea, um, but if you call for it, somebody that has a message, they, most always everyone's very pleasantly surprised uh, by it, and it usually ends up being uh, uh, very strong messages that, that will affect somebody's life, and it's a very profound experience for them. Right. You have to have an attitude of reverence and respect. In anything that you do, which brings me to the next subject that I wanted to share with our audience tonight was about the use of the Ouija board. I know you had talked um, that you used to do seances a lot, and, and now you use the Ouija board. Um, interesting enough, I used to teach classes on it to teach people um, the proper usage of it because, like anything else, it's a tool, and all tools can be used good or they can be used for not-so-good purposes. And the point is, is, is um, to it's not a game, it's not a toy. The Fold brothers, uh, William Fold, and I can never remember the other brother's name, were the ones that first created, um, and this, again, is back in the 1800s, uh, created the Ouija board, and uh, they actually took it around the country and was selling it and was using it in people's parlors to show them, you know, how to draw forth the information from, the, you know, the other side of the veil. Um, and then Parker Brothers um, approached them, and they sold all the rights to the Ouija board, and then Parker Brothers uh, then sold it as a toy. And unfortunately, uh, the reverence and the protection and the guidance that, that the tool was meant to be used as Unfortunately, it's put in the wrong hand. There's even been horror movies made about the Ouija board, which is sad, because it's like any other tool. It can be used for good or not. So, But I would really love to hear some of the information that you are getting from the Ouija board. Well, a lot of it was uh, personal information. Uh, we would always, again, say a prayer and ask for light and, and the highest and best good to uh, be around us. And I have a spirit guide named Michael, and he's kind of a, a rowdy counterpart to me, a male counterpart to me who's just living in the spirit world in this lifetime. And um, <clears throat> we've got a lot of good advice and a lot of uh, good information. Uh, oftentimes I'm told to work when my mother was alive, help my mother, and uh, it's a lot of good admonitions. And then... After my mother died, uh, my nieces and I were, were talking to the Ouija board, and we asked if my mother was there, and yes, and then we all got chills and started getting teary-eyed, and, and she had been in a coma after she'd had her stroke before she passed on, and, and uh, she gave us information that led us to understand that she was aware of everything that we had done, that we had been there, and, and it was just so such a huge relief to know that um, you know her soul was still in her body even even though it was paralyzed and shut down it was just a very moving healing experience for us to know that she could uh, could communicate with us from the spirit world and that um, we were there in the hospital with her in those last few days well and and i think that's the whole purpose is it, 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 the tools themselves are used not only, they are truly, I think, used for um, those of us who are left behind, so to speak, mm -hmm. and they do give us comfort, and they do give us um, that validation, and they do give us that information that is so needed uh, to rest our hearts and our minds and our, our, our souls uh, for any other numerous reasons. Um, you know, l let's talk a little bit about, because um, I don't want to run out of time here tonight, um, first of all, is I want to talk about the ability for people um, to be able to write to you have a couple of columnists there uh, where they can get advice or or get information i want you to share with the audience how they can get their free copy the website how they can contact fate, contact fate magazine i'd like to get that um, out so that everyone knows um, how, how all that process works sure well anyone is we love to have you uh, visit our website www.fatemag f a t e m a g dot com or just type in fate magazine on Google and it will take you to our website. We have an offer for a free sample issue for anyone who who emails. There's a special place on that, and uh, we welcome people to write and tell us their personal stories, their personal paranormal experiences. We do pay for any articles that we uh, publish in the magazine. We do have a couple of columnists who give it uh, par spiritual advice. Shirley McDaniel does spiritual counseling, and uh, she's available on our website, too, or just writing to the magazine, faith at fatemag.com. And then we also have a pet psychic, Jacqueline Smith, that if anyone has questions or about a pet or problems or or even if their pets have passed on, she's able to communicate with their spirit and, 
and finish um, unsolved uh, questions or problems or, and bring closure to situations. So those are, have been very, very popular in the magazine. Well, I need to write her because I have a, um, a cat that has changed personalities in the last two years for the better. Not that she was bad before because she was a loving cat before, but she's like something else is someone else has stepped in. It's very interesting. We were all talking about that last night during my healing circle that I do every Monday night. Mm -hmm. And um, I also have a dog that um, her name was Rocket. I think I told you about this one last time when we spoke. Mm -hmm. And um, she was very near and dear to my heart. And uh, I just loved her energy. And she shows up every once in a while. And uh, I think I need to contact her. She probably would love to know that you are aware that she's around you in the spirit world. Oh, that would be fabulous. So for any of you um, people out there that have loved ones, um, your uh, animals, please write to the magazine. Get your free subscription. You can always get the link on my website. We want to thank Phyllis for joining us here. Phyllis, it's been delightful to have you here with us tonight. Thank you. And we look forward to your um, update at the end of the summer. Many blessings. Thank you. More than talk, it's entertaining insight and discoveries. You're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. Welcome back, and you're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. We are here with Phyllis Baldy, editor and owner of Fate Magazine. We left off in the last segment, which, by the way, you're just so much fun, <laughs> talking about the Bang Sisters. Um, you said the 1800s, who used to manifest portraits and paintings um, and with a canvas over uh, on canvas that they could never debunk. I think that's a very, very interesting story. Um, and, and it's interesting that, that people throughout the ages, they, they have such unique gifts, and, and a lot of them in our history aren't repeated. You know, like I've never heard of anybody being able to manifest like that um, a painting. You know, well, there other are things. Spirit, yeah, there are spirit artists, but I think these, these just are the most beautiful, beautiful works. Well, I encourage everyone to. Um, what, what, um, what month is that in? Uh, this was in the uh, April 2004 issue. Faith is a monthly magazine, and the back issues are available from our website. Great. So we're going to talk. We're going to definitely fill them in on that because we, you know, for, especially on the back issues, we're going to get to all that so people know how to uh, get the back sub subscription or you know, individual ones as well as a subscription. And I know that you have a a really neat offer where you'll send everyone just a sample copy, which is a full copy, uh, free of charge, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But um, you also have a wonderful story about Mr. Mark Twain, and I think our listeners would be delighted to hear about because I know I was delighted with it. Yes, our wonderful author of uh, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, he had a lot of uh, premonitions and um, <clears throat> um, paranormal experiences in his life. He was totally open to the paranormal world. But, um, he, of course, he rubbed elbows with a lot of famous people in the world, um, royalty, leaders in politics, science, religion. He lectured all around the world. So he was he was a pretty high-profile kind of guy. <clears throat> anyway, he made the acquaintance of Helen Keller. And remember, she was blind, deaf, and dumb. <clears throat> However, she went on to achieve a higher education, and she was a very famous celebrity. It's so cool because she loved hanging around the rich and the famous, too, even though she couldn't hear, she couldn't see, she couldn't, she couldn't sense anything. But she had a very, very strong psychic sense, and Mark Twain recognized that and was aware of that, and they had some, some really cool uh, cool things. And uh, when she touched his hand, she said, oh, the books, the, the lovely, lovely books, mini books. She knew right away that he was a writer, and uh, then he was being silly. Uh, Mark Twain, he said, you know, and, and, you know, he was noted for his wisdom, and, and Helen Keller, of course, couldn't hear that, but she repeated the words verbatim. There's no <laughs> way to know that, she, that what Mark Twain had said. And... Um, <clears throat> Um, he, you know, he talked to her and he explained how he picked his uh, gnome de plume, Mark Twain, and he explained to her that it suited his personality. He was light on the surface, and then Helen Keller chimed in and finished his thought for saying it's sometimes deep because Mark Twain, of course, refers to depth of the water. Oh my gosh! And, and he would he would uh, test test with her, and uh, he approached Helen Keller silently and ran his hands through her hair. And she recognized, and of course, she did. But they, she just knew so many things about uh, people when she, when she would touch them or, you know, she could telepathically see them, who they were, what they were about. That's just a wonderful, wonderful story. Now, that's what they leave out when you're in school, when they teach you about Helen Keller. I think oh, yeah, you never heard about her <laughs> no. clairvoyant abilities that she, she psychically... Well, a lot of blind people can see color. I've, I've, I've experienced that uh, with blind people. They can put their hand on a cloth and tell you if it's red or blue or black or white. That, isn't that fascinating for somebody that can't see, too? And a lot of these people were born that way where they never mm -hmm. experienced color right. uh, through sight whatsoever. 
And, uh, you know, I, I've always felt that, you know, if, if you have something that is not working uh, properly in your body, whether it be your sight, your hearing, your smell, whatever, or even the ability to speak or talk, um, rather, um, it makes up for it because there's a lot of acuteness there that most of us miss out on. Um, we don't need to develop those exactly. sensitive uh, capabilities. Exactly. But, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about Mark Twain and Helen Keller and even the Bang Sisters because back in those days, and we're talking about the 1800s into the early 1900s, you know, we now call ourselves psychics or clairvoyants or mediums or channels or what have you. Um, but the term back in those days was called spiritualism. Mm -hmm. um, there was a huge, and it was really a fad or a craze at, at that point, where many, many things came to the surface about the human spirit um, in, in those days and age of what we call spiritualism. Um, the old houses used to have parlors, and the parlors were, you know, for entertaining, playing games, and that's where a lot of the mediums or spiritualists would come into somebody's home and they would uh, perform seances, they would use the Ouija board, um, they would even use tarot cards, although I don't know that's what they called them back in those days. And, and this is how the readings and, and the information was shared. Um, it was all done in the home and people just open. You know, you were part of the hip crowd if you had somebody coming into your oh, home yeah. doing this. Absolutely. And I know you you yourself um, have, have been amongst and, and been a part of many seances. Mm -hmm. You gave us that stories. If you, I'd love to hear some some more stories about your seances. Well, I first was experienced lucky to experience a professional seance at a spiritualist camp in Wanawak, uh, Wisconsin. And I also had a friend who was a spiritualist minister and showed us how to do a lot of the uh, the techniques. We used to have uh, our own little homemade farm seances up in our old haunted farmhouse when no one lived there and we would black out the, the living room, the parlor and hang blankets and quilts, whatever we had over the door and have a wooden table in there and, and all sit around the wooden table and have a candle and recite the Lord's Prayer or sing uh, Jesus Loves Me, that's the only hymn we all knew, <laughs> all being young and crazy wild kids and uh, then we would extinguish the lights and ask for spirits to come and we had some just wonderful uh, phenomena and experiences that manifested themselves. It was uh, a real life-changing kind of experience. My grandparents came around and, and my my uh, brother's mother-in-law appeared uh, who had been deceased for some time. So it was, was very special and profound experiences. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. We're going to pick up some more on those seances, but don't go away. We'll be right back. Email Rebecca with your comments to mailbag at journeyswithrebecca.com. You're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. Welcome back, and you're listening to Journeys with Rebecca. We are here with Bill Scaldi, editor and owner of Fate Magazine. And we are just having a delightful time. First of all, I just want to say, you know, in between uh, the commercials here, we get to chat a little bit, and, and th I think there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that I always like to, you know, kind of express to the um Listeners out there, that some of the, some of the best stuff, unfortunately, isn't always recorded. <laughs> but we certainly have been having a good time. You know, one of the things that we talked about before was um, the whole life after death experience. Um, we've talked a little bit in the past about some um, what we call the you you uh, termed it spiritualism, and there was some ghostly paintings. We're also going to cover in the next couple of segments here. Um, things on seances and the Ouija board. I think that's just really important um, to enlighten people on those two particular subject matters. But let's start out with the whole life after death um, belief system that you have and your, your thought processes on that, if we could, Phyllis. Sure. Well, I definitely believe that, <clears throat> excuse me, that life continues on after we depart this mortal coil. And probably two profound experiences dealt with my parents. I lost my mother and 1993 and my father in 95. My mother had a, a massive stroke here at my house. It was interesting that it happened here. Um, there, are, I have four older brothers, but it, uh, I think she chose to leave here. And there's a vortex downstairs. She was writing out Christmas cards and she collapsed by the desk down there, right for, by a vortex. And uh, we took her to the hospital and she was in a she had a massive stroke and she was in a coma for nine days. And then uh, uh, she died on a full moon. A month later, on the full moon. She appeared to me downstairs in the next room. There was like a TV uh, kind of uh, den down there, and she walked through the doorway close to where the vortex was. But at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, I was still so devastated. I, you know, I just started crying. I couldn't deal with it. But since then, she has appeared to me uh, a few times. One night, I was lying in my bedroom. This was a 
couple of years ago. And I woke up, and here was my mother, my grandmother, and uh, my aunt, her sister. They were all three standing by the side of the bed. And my mother says, so I bought Ma and Sis. This is a Scandinavian way, you know. Her mother was with Ma and Sis was my aunt's nickname. I bought Ma and Sis to show them your house. And I thought, oh, okay. And I rolled over and went back to sleep. I didn't think anything of it. It was just like so commonplace, like if they would have stopped in in the middle of the day. <laughs> and uh, that was just a neat experience. There was like no question about it that they were alive and well in the spirit world. Well, and I had a similar experience. My father passed away when I was just a teenager. And it was about, I'm going to say, about a week after he passed. And I remember it being a full moon. I think that's interesting correlation there. Mm -hmm. Because my bedroom was lit up. I can remember that. You know, the moon was shining in where you didn't need a light. You could see in the house. And I woke up, and there he was standing at the end of my bed, and he started talking to me. But the interesting thing was is that he brought my mother's father, who had passed away, my grandfather, with him. And those two in the mortal world were not friendly with each other. But yet, on the other side, they they were both with each other. They made their and, peace. Yes, they did. And, you know, that right there, when I was a teenager, really, really signified to me about that life does go on, that it is eternal, that it is that we are all immortal um, to some degree. Obviously, we're not in physical form. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and it's, it's really strange, too, fellas, because in those days, I didn't have anything to equate it with other than, to me, everyone was ghosts, mm -hmm. you know. Um but he, he had definitely, and he talked to me, and, you know, he was almost as solid, I'm going to tell you, he was, he was just as solid as he was standing there. And uh, he had a message for me, and he told me what I needed to do, and then, of course, I was pretty devastated because it had only been a week, and I reached out and told him not to go, and he told, said, don't touch me, and I did it anyway, and then that's when he left. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was very, you know, I, I remember shaking my head later thinking, well, was that a dream or was it real? It's a life-changing event, though, when something yeah. like that happens, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it absolutely, it's bittersweet. Mm -hmm. It truly is bittersweet, just like when your mom come to visit you. It was great, but yet there's a sadness associated with the joy. Mm -hmm. And so it's that bittersweet experience. And, you know, of course, when you're younger, you don't recognize that term, bittersweet, but it's very apropos, I think, especially in instances like this. So that changed a lot of things for me right then and there. And then my guides became even stronger because from the time I was an early teenager until I was a late teenager when my father died, I really wasn't paying attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were yakking. But after that, I, I started to listen a lot more. It was pretty interesting. So for, you know, um, for people out there, they, they, they just need to know that those experiences truly are real. Um, we're much stronger in spirit than most people recognize, even when we're still mortal, still physical, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So, you know, the next thing, you know, we've been talking about ghosts, but let's talk about, you gave me a wonderful story, and hopefully we won't run out of time, and if we do, we'll pick it up on the next segment. But I would love for you to relate the story about the ghostly paintings. Oh. That is absolutely fascinating to me. It started uh, during the era of spiritualism around the late 1800s, and the Bang Sisters were just very, very remarkable young women. <clears throat> They would put their hands on a canvas and they would put a covering over it and they would have a person seated there and they'd have the paint sitting out and, and, and covered up and all of a sudden somebody would, would paint a picture, would paint a portrait. And sometimes it would take half an hour, 45 minutes. It would happen very, very fast that, that some magical invisible hand would sketch these portraits. And then when the portrait was fully uh, finished, the eyes would open. And they did this many, many times, and these original paintings are still at uh, at some of the spiritualist camps, uh, Lilydale and uh, in in New York. So I, it's just absolutely fascinating that this happened. No one was ever to able to prove that they were fraudulent. Many, many people examined them, but uh, no one no one could prove that it was otherwise because it, there were so many witnesses that would watch this happen. But they actually manifested spiritual paintings. And they're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. Oh, my gosh. Well, stay tuned because we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about those times and future times. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. Find out more about a show topic or guest. Log on to www.journeyswithrebecca.com. I'd like to thank my guests tonight for sharing their wonderful information and knowledge with us. And a special thanks goes out to you, the listeners. Now, you know, the guests I have on air are given the opportunity to share their viewpoints or ideas. Now, you and I have the opportunity 
of choice in regards to those ideas or viewpoints. Be sure to check in next week for more enlightening educational talk and discoveries. This is Rebecca of Journeys with Rebecca. Until we meet again, where will your life's journey take you? Many blessings and good night.